it folded and it worked. It got under the door. Um, we can talk more about the, the design afterwards. The, the great thing about this ChemBots project and the great experience for me is it brought together industry partners. You know, we worked with iRobot, the guys who made Roomba and the, uh, the PackBot, right? The, we worked with uh, researchers at MIT, a distributed robotics algorithm, so people who figure out how to get a bunch of different unintelligent robots to do something useful. Uh, mathematicians who work on proofs of what is possible and impossible with origami. Uh, chemistry, George Whiteside, one of the giants in the field, you know, went to him for material science questions and, and you know, what polymers can we use? What kind of new materials are there? You know, we handled the fabrication. We're really good at, at making things. Um, and then mathematics, you know, we, we needed that to kind of just, I don't know, figure everything out and, and how, to, how big and, and small to make everything. And the, the question we kind of asked around the table was, what is the state of the art? You know, what have people done in soft robotics? And, and you know, state of the art is one of these buzzwords, right? It's another one of those jargon things that you may, you know, feel, I don't quite know what he means when he says that. And all I mean is the best that we can do right now. So whenever you're state of the art, it just means we haven't done any better. This is literally the front. This is the line between dreams and reality, right? This is as far as we've come, and it's always pushing forward. And every time a new research paper comes out, it's like, all right, well, the state of the art has changed. Um, and that's the reason why we write research papers and we do literature reviews. So literature review is something that I know, I feel like every graduate student has to go through where you're reading 50, 100, 200 research papers. <laughs> I, they've been doing this forever and I'm glad that they have Google now because I don't have to print them out. I can just read them on the computer. Um, but you have to go through and you have to see what people have done before and you have to understand, all right, well, here's where we are. Now, how do we go forward? And this was very difficult because of translating jargon. Um, so jargon is difficult when scientists uh, try to communicate. And it's also difficult when scientists try to communicate with each other, right? So um, we have here, we have roboticists, mathematicians, chemistry people, uh, other roboticists focusing on different types of robots and mathematicians. And I'm trying to read all these papers and understand everybody's language. And they're all calling the same thing different things or using different names. Uh, and, and I realized that what we were doing is, is really just translating. And I'm going to get to the MI, or what I call the main idea. And it's that acronyms and jargon, both conf they both confuse simple ideas. So I'm convinced that there's nothing that I can't teach you. Maybe not string theory, but it's only because I don't know it. Um, but the, the reason that, that we can't communicate is because I'm using a word that has a bunch of other concepts built into it. I say dielectric. I say elastomer. And I, it means so much to me, and it means nothing to you. And we kind of just, we use that to, to speak more efficiently when we're talking to people who understand us. But it, you know, when, it, when we're trying to communicate across boundaries and across fields, it just makes things difficult. And unfortunately, most of the exciting research happens at the interfaces of different subjects. Um, so this is a big problem. I don't, I don't have an answer. But um, one of the things uh, that we do, so we, we take, uh, we make acronyms of jargon, right? <laughs> Which, which is ridiculous because now we, we say DEA, DEA, DEA. You read that in a paper a hundred times and you know, you're like, I don't even know what a DEA is. You're like, oh, well, it's a, it's a dielectric elastomer actuator. Oh, obviously, I know, I know what that is, right? <laughs> um, so then you figure out, all right, well, a dielectric is something that insulates. And you know, if you don't understand what insulation is, then we'll have to talk about you know, electric charge and things like that. And they say elastomer. What is that? Oh, that's just rubber. Well, why don't we call it rubber? I don't know. We call it elastomer. Um, actuator. That's you know, thing that makes stuff move. Right, so I propose, well, I, I missed my punchline. There'll be a punchline later. Um, <laughs> you'll get it, everyone will laugh. Uh, so, so let's talk about another piece of jargon called smart materials, which was what I had to wade through. Uh, smart materials, neither smart nor materials. Uh, <laughs> so everybody here knows what smart means, and everyone knows what materials mean, and you could kind of think what a smart material is, right? It's some material that has some intelligence. Uh, not true. So what we mean by smart material is something that can push or pull or make something happen. So most materials like wood, steel, uh, carbon fiber, they just act as structure. But these smart materials can do something. So instead of having to add a separate actuator, a separate motor, we can use the material itself and the frame of the robot to do all the work for us. So this is great because we can eliminate an entire system, right? We don't have to put an engine on it. Uh, so that's what they mean when they say smart materials. Maybe they think it's smart because they're the guys who thought of it and like, well, that was smart. Um, <laughs> So I say not smart, but more like active, soft materials. So this kind of gets the idea, right? They're active, they're moving, and they're soft, they're squishy. Uh, but they're not really materials. As we saw with the, the dielectric elastomers, this was the peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? Bread, peanut butter and jelly, bread. It's not just peanut butter, it's not just jelly, it's, it's four things, or in our case, it's three. It's 
electrode, electrode, and something in the middle. So it's a combination. It's a composite of materials. And you know, they, they're talking about them like they're materials, and they're not. And it's very confusing and frustrating. <laughs> um, yeah. Back in. OK. Um, so so to, I, I think I already beat this horse, so we'll move forward. Yeah, that's the fun time, right? We should call them uh, insulating rubber thing that makes stuff move. <laughs> um, but that's harder to say than DEA, so uh, we'll move along. And then you know, the idea, what about is generators? We mentioned before that things that can push or pull can also generate. So I've heard researchers confusing jargon go, well, it's a, dielect it's a DEA generator, right? Dielectric elastor actuator generator. Well, that's kind of very contradicting, right? It's, it's actuating and generating? No, it's not. Um, so even the researchers themselves don't think about what these words means. It's like saying ATM machine. Right? Um, so back to the, to the literature review. How is this actually useful? Well, now we've translated all the jargon. We understand what the state of the art is. How do we go from this huge thing of text and, and research and, and um, citations and look at the state of the art and understand what the state of the art is? And how do I communicate that to my peers? Uh, so don't be afraid. This is probably the most confusing thing I have in the talk, but the words don't really matter. I mean, they do to me, but. Uh, <laughs> so all we need to know is that on every arrow, there's something we care about. We care about efficiency. We care about strain, which is just how much it moves. We care about stress, which is how much force it can put out. And plotted at each, at each point, and each color is a different material. So right here, we have the best that a dielectric elastomer ever did in terms of efficiency, the best it ever did in terms of strain. You know, and then we can compare dielectric elastomers, natural muscle, you know, in red. We do ferroelectric relaxer polymers. And we can start to see, if I, if I asked you, which, which material is the best on this chart? Which, which color? Blue. Blue, right? So it becomes immediately obvious from, from 200 research papers to this chart what I should be working on and what I should be spending my time on and what the entire ChemBots team should be focusing on, right? The blue one, because it has the most potential. Was there a material that was 80% efficient with 400% strain? No. But the material has the capabilities and has the potential to do it. Um, so, I, so I used that, and we applied it to ChemBots, and we, we tried to, to make it work. And unfortunately, the, the materials themselves aren't that great, which we learned through experiments. So now that we've chosen, you know, we've gone soft actuation, we've communicated effectively between scientists, and now we've moved to picking one. So we, we had a whole bunch of different uh, technologies we could try. Now we pick dielectric elastomer actuators. And we move forward and say, okay, let's deflate. And I mean this in the nicest way possible. Deflate the research results. So even in research papers, there's a tendency to assume that just because you know, the fly flew that one time, it can do it every single time. And that's not always the case. And the practical matter is, you know, the, the practical issues often make a, a substance or material not useful, uh, especially for, for us as engineers who are, are trying to build real things and not just theoretical results. Um, so we already saw this, and we all understand what that is. The experiments, right? So we actually take the elastomer, so that, that dielectric elastomer we've been talking all about. That's it right up there. That's the calipers with the dots on it. It's just a, it's a piece of tape. You can buy it from 3M. It's used to hold mirrors up. Um, it doesn't conduct electricity, and it stretches a lot. Stretch it out, uh, and then I, I paint the electrodes on it. We, we put the bread on top, and then we apply voltage. And that voltage is one kilovolt, which is 1,000 volts, which is a lot of voltage. Very, very little current. They're, they're pretty efficient, but it's, it's a very high voltage. And you learn this through trial and error. And that film, uh, after it's stretched out, is, I want to say it's like 10 microns thick. So it's, it's one tenth the thickness of a human hair. Um, so it's very, very, very small and thin. And we have to put 1,000 volts. So if we wanted to do this on a large scale and use a thick piece, we'd have to put an unimaginable amount of voltage on it. It would never work. So we, you learn that. And also through these experiments, and you can see here, you know, that's the before, and that's the after. And you can see that there's, you get these huge strains, which is why these are exciting materials and everybody's talking about them. But the practical uh, application was that they just weren't very good at making robots. Uh, so I, I started to think about how we can use the elastomer part. And you know, Becca kind of pointed out the minimum energy structure, right? So this, we, we forget about the, the, the compliant electrodes part which never makes its way into DEA, right? Dielectric elastomer doesn't say with compliant electrodes. But so we use the dielectric elastomer, we stretch it out, we add some, uh, we attach it to this, and it wants to pull in. So we've, we change the length of this film, attach it to this, and now it wants to pull in, because the rubber band wants to go back. So it's, it's shrinking, but it can't shrink the frame. So the frame bends. And this is a, a biological principle. This is why flowers 
have ridges on the edge and they look so beautiful. This is why when you rip a plastic bag, it gets wrinkles. This is why a blade of grass tilts over. Uh, this is. Can you fix your mic? Yes, I can. I didn't know everyone was so mad at me. I apologize. Um, what was that about the ribs? So, what's that? About the ridges. So, so the edges of flowers curve. And that happens because during growth, the inside parts grow at a certain rate and the outside parts grow at a faster rate. So because there is extra material, it has to bunch up and it forms ridges. And that's what we're exploiting here when we do these minimum energy structures, which I can explain why they were that, but we'll just call them that for now. And we get all these beautiful things. Uh, but the problem so is these I... These things are, are trying to make negative curvature? What's that? These things are trying to make negative curvature? They, they actually form... Uh, like saddles? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, they, we think and we're, we're proving now that they actually are minimum energy shapes, that these are the things that minimize what we call the strain energy and the amount of stretching energy in something. And it's a balance between the stretching energy in this film and the bending energy in the frame. And it takes on... They would be plateau surfaces? Maybe. I'm not a very good mathematician. And uh, the math, oh, so he said they would be plateau surfaces, which if you're not a mathematician, uh, that probably doesn't make any sense to you. It barely makes sense to me, so don't feel bad. But um, it has to do with you know, the, the shape that these things actually form. And we could talk offline about this more, because um, it's a bit even high for, for my level. I just wanted to use a buzzword. <laughs> there you go. Um, he just wanted to use a buzzword in case he didn't. <laughs> so the, these are great, right? They're beautiful, but we have no idea what's going to form. I don't know. I didn't know that this was going to happen. That's like the most impressive one, right? I had no idea that that was going to happen. And as researchers, as engineers, we need to be able to predict in order to use these things to design with and to make robots. Um, so I started to work on models. And the mathematicians told me that the analytical problem couldn't be solved. We couldn't do it using equations. We had to do it numerically. So I used numerical simulations, and, uh, which is just using a computer to, to brute force, kind of calculate through uh, simple physics formulas to, to come up with these minimum energy structures. And I'm, right now, I'm comparing what comes out of the computer to what happens in real life. We take 3D scans of the shapes and compare them to the simulations. And they're matching very, very, very well using the most basic of like freshman physics, um, which is amazing. So this brings us to now, right? So we've gone from chemical robots. I want to make something that fits through a hole looked at the entire field, found the state of the art, went to dielectric elastomers because they were the most promising, went to these minimum energy structures because they were a way to make dielectric elastomers useful and beautiful without having to make robots that move because that was really hard to do. Um, <laughs> now, to, very honest right now. This is not what the newspaper would say, but it's true. Um, and now I'm working on what I call soft mechanical engineering. So in doing all this research and in, in translating all these concepts, I realized that uh, my undergraduate institution did a, a disservice by not teaching me these things. And in fact, every engineering, mechanical engineering undergraduate doesn't teach these things. We make approximations for small bending, for small strains. We don't do large curvatures. We don't do large strains. And all the formulas that we memorize and we, we use are just, they go out the window. And we have to go back to the basics and rethink soft mechanical, like rethink what it is to be a soft mechanical engineer. And you know, I'm just right here at the end, I'm about to finish up, and this is just kind of what we're thinking about, right? So we have these minimum energy structures, and I was working with Chuck Hoberman, if anybody knows, I don't have a picture because I didn't know if I could show it, but the Hoberman sphere, it's the, uh, the really spiky looking thing that you open it up and it turns like a big geodesic dome. Look it up on Google at Hoberman sphere. So I was talking to, to Chuck about this, and he was like, well, what if, you, what if you switched it around? What if you didn't have the elastomer in the center, that, that tape stretch? What if you stretched the outside ring? and have the thing in the center stay the same length. So here we have an inner tube and a rope, and the rope doesn't change length, and we pump it up, and it forms a saddle. And it shows that these are, these are principles that we can use large-scale inflatable structures. We can make micro-sized stents that we can put inside the human body, and maybe they react to whatever chemicals get released when you have a stroke, so it opens up the, the arteries, you know, and it changes shape. You know, maybe we make a squishy robot that can slide our door. It, it doesn't matter because now we have something to design with. You know, we, we have something that we can use. Um, and I wish I had a more eloquent way to end uh, other than pretty pictures. But I didn't think of one. So if, please ask me questions and let's, let's talk. Thank you very much.